All right, so uh, people are coming over right now. Hey, Greg, glad you're in the room. Uh, absolutely, Hans, glad you're here. Glad you're here. Glad everybody's here. Um, so I'm going to start off, uh, I think, with a little poll question. Um, we're going to start with the um, – actually, are you currently using carbon – if I could spell, that would be good. <laughs> Fiber. We'll start with this one. This, I think, is an easy question. Um, so we're, we're just interested in, 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 you know, who's using carbon fiber AFOs, who's not using carbon fiber AFOs. And then I think we'll ask the question as to if you are using them, are you using prefab or custom? Just so we can get a little bit of an idea as to what's happening. So all, all you have to do. If you're in the room, is click on yes or click on no. Um, it's easy. That'll just help us understand a little bit about, you know, who's using them, who's not. It's about even right now, uh, about 50%. We got about 24 votes in. Keep them coming, everybody. If you haven't answered, please answer. Give us a, give us a little bit of insight. That'll help us. And okay, so I'm going to stop that. I guess we've tapped out. Let's see, 27, we've got 50 in the room. Anybody else? Don't be shy now. Click on. <laughs> so it looks like it looks like about 50 50. Um, so that's interesting. So if if they're using custom. Or prefab. Let's see that one, right? Um, what type? So, so, or prefab. Let's see. Right? Some prefab. So if you are using, and you did say yes to the question, We'd love to know whether you're using custom or prefab uh, carbon fiber uh, AFOs, carbon composite AFOs, or both. Good point, Barry. I could have I could have said that. <laughs> that should have been a third option. Yes, C should have been a third option. <laughs> uh, good good point. Thanks, thanks for that one. Um, because you would probably, there are cases where you might use a prefab, right, Ross? Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, obviously, cases, as you had shown, which were great on, um, you know, using a custom. Um, okay, so uh, Darren had, uh, Ross, are you diagno diagnostic? Are you diagnosing fiberglass walking cast in your prescription process? Are you... Diagnostic fiberglass walking casts in your prescription process? I don't get that question, but maybe you will understand a little better. Um, I'm not quite sure um, if the question is, am I using carbon AFOs to trial patients um, during the eval process? Um, I do try to rule out custom versus uh, off the shelf. So I do have a set of off the shelf carbon bases that I typically put people in just to kind of watch their gait and see how they respond. Um, if they need a higher level of, level of control, then I'll go ahead and do a custom. Uh, but some people that just have sagittal plane weakness, I, I'll i just go ahead and fit them with an off the shelf. I'm not quite sure if that answers the question. Um, he said he wants to know if you walk the patient in the eval process for coverage. Um, well, yeah, I always, during my initial evaluation, I walk and assess the patient. Um, and then basically I choose my brace design and then I have to submit for approval based on the brace design that I choose. But yeah, I do obviously walk the patient and do a whole eval, a clinical assessment. Okay. Um, and I'm sure we have some other uh, questions. I'd love, we'd love uh, you guys to pop a couple questions uh, out for us. Um, if you have anything, uh, you know, that that's come up from the uh, presentations that you've seen thus far, um, just either type it in. How long will the AFO last? Two to two, two years or five years? 
You want to answer that, Barry, or you want me to answer that? <laughs> uh, I, well, again, um, I'm going to give you sort of a non-answer, but uh, <laughs> a lot of it depends on who you're fitting it on. You know, if it's the uh, if someone who's wearing, you know, walk, doing marathons or something like that, it's that's one issue. If it's someone who is, uh, you know, 70 years old, just wants to go grocery shopping or something like that, then uh, we, we've done cycle testing. In fact, we just got finished doing cycle testing on one of our very popular AFOs, and it was over a million cycles. So um, I don't know what that translates to in terms of longevity, but we think that that's a pretty big milestone uh, in terms of its, its you know, durability. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm um, seeing people three to five years, typically. Um, the only thing that really wears out on these are just basically strap repairs occasionally. Um, the carbon itself holds up really well. Um, and Barry will speak to, I don't know how many I've done in 10 years, but I think I've maybe done one or two that actually I had to have repaired because they broke. But um, And a lot of that also has to do with choosing the correct design. And if you, you, know, if you call Barry and you want to do a lateral strut, on somebody that's really heavy and got a lot of, uh, you know, deformity, he's probably going to steer you away from that design and use a different design just because it's more inherently stable. So being the right brace design and the activity level and weight of the patient is going to be critical in that. Mm -hmm. I, I also want to point out too, that uh, the most common problem we've had is that people fracture the foot plate, uh, usually at the metatarsal heads. And it's because they uh, kneel down or they kneel on the back of their heels or they, you know, squat on the back of their heels and they severely bend it, you know, uh, quite a bit. And uh, that is repairable. We can repair foot plates. On, uh, so you don't have to start all over again. We can sand off the foot plate, put a new foot plate on, and, it, it you know, it's just the same brace, basically. It's a very minimal charge, even if it's out of warranty. But we've also just increased our warranty from, a year to 18 months and the more cycle testing we do we want to increase the warranty longer because we're more confident in, the, in our process and in, in our materials yeah. are um are you guys open to other types of designs that come from yeah um, i mean i don't you know i mean we i think we have including the partial feet stuff i think we have about 12 different designs so i'm not I, I really don't want to get back to the plastic designs because uh, we, we're trying to stay away from, not stay away from, but we just don't. We, do we make solid ankle AFOs that look like plastic AFOs? Yes, we do. Uh, but it's mainly for people that have like crushed heel injuries that need immobilization of the heel or something like that. That would be the reason for making an old fashioned type plastic AFO design. But we're open to any design. Uh, that people are interested in. The only trouble is, is that people want to usually experiment, and then if something breaks, it's of course our fault that it broke. Because uh, you know, we 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 want to make sure that the mechanics are going to be there, uh, not just because it looks cool, but that the mechanical properties of the brace are going to be helpful to the patient. Exactly. Uh, Roger Marzano asked, uh, "Do you feel confident that the custom uh, carbon AFOs will last five years for Medicare patients?" Do I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I've had many people last more than five years. Yeah. Um, and Becky uh, asked, uh, do you have any contacts for pediatric orthotists in the Houston, Texas area? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, sure can, I'm sure they can. Pediatric orthotists. Nothing on that. <laughs> Good question. We do a lot of work in Texas, so uh, yeah, yeah, we can we can email her what we have in our database. So yeah, awesome. Um, and, and after the event, you'll all, you'll get the, uh, uh, you know, the transcript of all the comments. So you'll know who to contact and, and so forth. Um, Dahlia, uh, Zwick. Hi, Dahlia. How are you? Uh, Dahlia's done a little bit of writing for us. Um, do you have issues with skin irritation and what straps do you use? Thickness, etc. Our standard strap is an inch and a half and it's a trifold Velcro. So it's a fairly thick Velcro. Uh, it's got us, you know, it's soft on both sides. Uh, we ultrasonically weld all of our Velcro attachments. There's no sewing involved. Uh, so uh, we think they're, you know, pretty durable. We have two inch Velcro that we can use in special cases. Uh, I would probably prefer, if we have a really large patient, uh, I would probably prefer using two inch and a half straps, you know, separated a little bit if you really have a lot of uh, volume you want to contain. Uh, some people use like a, 
like a posterior lateral strut and they want an anterior shell they really want to control the top of the uh, top of the leg and we've done a couple of different straps strapping arrangements like that we also do a lot of strapping arrangements for uh pttd patients where we run the strap from the arch up around the lateral strut and pull them out of varus using you know starting from the arch up i think something something like this where it starts so you probably can't see this but it starts in the arch area here and goes up and goes around the lateral strut with the d-ring if you can see that there so and that's pretty effective and it's also patient adjustable which is important uh, because he's not running back to Ross to get his AFO fixed all the time. They can adjust how much they want. I think most PTD patients don't really care about a brace, <laughs> but they need one. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, you give them something that at least mechanically well, uh, functions well. They just have to be, you know, ones that use it. So. Mm -hmm. um, I got a question uh, came from um, came from uh, Joseph Allert. Uh for hand cast, how is the thickness of the cast accommodated for after scanning? How do you accommodate uh, for after scanning? We use we use Vorm software, uh, CanFit software, and so that is very easy in that software to reduce the the assumption. There is that the cast is uniform all the way throughout. You know what I mean? And uh, that's that's an assumption, you know what I mean? But the fact that it's not, most of our designs are not circumferential. They're, they don't go all the way around things. They're just a strut here or a strut there. Uh, that really is not much of an issue, as uh, as Ross alluded to, when it accommodates, you know, swelling, stuff like that. Uh, so uh, you'd have much less problems because you're not circumferentially covering the whole limb. You're, you're just using a strut to go up one side of the leg or the or not. And then where it is, when it does go around the limb, uh, you'll see a lot of Russ's designs here go up and they have like a T-strap at the top. The T-strap part is flexible. The strut is stiff, but the, the further away it gets from the strut, the more flexible it is. So you can increase or decrease the circum circ circumference of, of the strap there, and it's not too bothersome to the patient to do that. Awesome. That's the, benefit, that's the benefit of the pre-preg, you know, the idea is that you can make something flexible and then, you know, an inch or two away, it can be super rigid, so. Um, are there any pathologies that you actually believe that carbon fiber would not work for? I'll, I'll throw that one back to you, Ross. Yeah, so one comes to mind is basically your acute CVAs, your acute strokes um, have really strong extensor tone. Um, and they'll have triplanar deformity. So um, if that foot is really in a coinous position and you have to control the forefoot, um, then you basically need a more enclosed foot. Now, you know, Barry has done designs where they include an SMO uh, with carbon to help with that. Um, but there are some cases, TBIs combined, very, very strong tone. Um, and you basically need to encapsulate the whole foot in order to control that tone. So it just is on a case by case basis. And you got to kind of look at the patient and, and determine what type of control, what level of control you need. And some of them just can't be controlled unless the foot is enclosed more. Mm -hmm. um, if the strut's too flexible, can the AFO be returned to increase the stiffness? Fair. Yes, yes. It's very rare that the strut is flexible. It might be the foot plate that is too flexible, and that's very easy for us to fix. We can just uh, add more layers to the foot plate and run it through the autoclave again, and it bonds securely to the foot plate. So, yes, that, there is variation there. Or the same thing is true if, it, if it's too stiff. We've often gotten uh, braces back, and we sand off the foot plate and make a make a more flexible foot plate. So, uh, but it's kind of rare that the strut itself would be we, – we make the strut fairly stiff uh, for good reason. We want to transfer forces from the top of the leg down to the floor and from the floor back up to the top of the leg. So. Okay. Um, what type of orthotic is best to improve forefoot adduction? Adduction or abduction? Abduct. Uh, it says adduction. Adduction. So there have been times where I've had patients that have forefoot uh, adduction where I will ask Barry to 
extend the trim line on the on the on the foot plate, actually bring it up, leave it out past the first metatarsal, um, and raise it a little bit so that it can't adduct right there. So there are some modifications you can actually make to the foot plate of the design itself to kind of help that. Um, but if the foot's supinating a lot, that that's a tough one. So um, because the actual first ray is actually elevating and they're going into a supinated position. Um, so yeah, basically clinically, you just have to look at that and, and do it like you would any other modification, whatever you need to control, you know, you need to bring your trims lines out a little bit further and extend them a little higher. Um, you can have that actually done uh, on the actually molded footbed that Barry makes. Yeah. Becky said, yes. Uh, Sudination with four foot adduction and in an inver an inversion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those typically tend to be a really high tone, extensor tone patients. Um, and in some of those, I just can't put in carbon. I actually have to, I'll do a plastic articulated AFO molded inner boot that basically encompasses, you know, all the way out to the med heads over the volar surface of the foot, just because that's the only way I can control that. Mm -hmm. But there are some tricks to, um, when I mentioned earlier, you can position if the, if the patient has the range to get into about five degrees of dorsiflexion, what that does is that will break up that extensor tone yeah. uh, and you can actually hold them in that position. So as they get over, the, as they land at heel strike, they're actually landing uh, with a, to encourage deflection. And that way the knee doesn't get back into extension and their extension tone doesn't kick in. So sometimes you can actually get rid of that tone just by strategically placing the position of your AFO in a, in a certain position, right. if you can get there. Yeah, it's, it's positionally triggered sometimes. So, I mean, and that's the benefit of a custom, you know, AFO again. You can get something that's built by us, like that CP kid who was running there. Those were built in like 12 degrees of dorsiflexion, you know what I mean? So uh, you can get that on any any design we have, so. Well, that's one of the, the uh, benefits of going custom. Right. You can make the product to exact your exact specifications. Yeah. I mean, uh, to 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 add in to what Ross has said, you know, I thought in the beginning that we couldn't do kids with, who had CP because of you know spasticity and tone stuff like that because we had these springs everywhere, you know, the foot plate that sprung and that kind of thing. And really, what it means is that we just need to stiffen up the area of the brace that doesn't, you know, that triggers the the, the clonus or the or the spasticity. You know what I mean? So yeah. once we do that, I think they're more successful in using even an open design where we, where we have. If you can control, you know, the supination part as well. So. Um, uh, Natraya from uh, Thailand asked, how much is the approximate cost for one prefab compared to custom-made carbon AFO for a drop foot patient? I am not positive what... Prefab prices are now, but uh, our prices range between three seventy and about four ninety five, five hundred, roughly, in that area. Mm -hmm. I don't and know what. Uh, maybe you would know. Maybe you would know, Ross, what the uh, prefab stuff is. Yeah, most of the pre prefab carbon AFOs now are running in the lower two hundreds, uh, up to about two eighty. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Really, there's not a big difference in purchase price. Mm -hmm. Not at all. And the reimbursement on them is significantly different. I yes. would imagine. Yeah. Dramatically different. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For sure. Um, okay. Uh, any other uh, any other questions uh, on the uh, on the audience? A turnaround. What's your turnaround for custom fat? Our uh, turnaround is two days in house for us. So that's fast. Just to give you an example, so I started using scanning because I'm on the West Coast. So I'm in Washington State and Barry's all the way over in Rhode Island. Um, so before, you know, I would actually have to take a cast, send it through the mail, and it was two to three days to get there. Then he would make it in two days, and then it was two to three days to get back. And I've cut it down significantly now. Basically, I just scan. Uh, it goes out the same day. Barry makes it in two days and ships it back in the uh, second day. And so I'm getting these turned around in a week from Washington State. So, so that's really helped me. A preference of a scanner? What's your preference of scanner, Ross? Do you have a preference? Well, I'm using TechMed. Um, basically, when I started working with Hang Hanger, that was um, kind of the direction they were moving. 
Um, I really like that scanner. I like their software. Um, it allows you to scan multiple body segments, so you're not limited to, you know, just AFOs. You can do KFOs. I do cranials with it. Um, I do all kinds of prosthetics with it. So um, it just allows you a little bit more flexibility. Mine was actually mine is actually the kind Barry showed in his presentation. I have the case with the hand scanner and the cables, mm -hmm. um, which is not super portable, um, but I basically have it set up in a room where I can, you know, scan all my my positive uh, casts. What's the cost on that? Do you know offhand? I Barry knows because he bought one, but uh, one was provided by Hanger, so I don't know what. Well, even the even the high end ones are getting cheaper. I, when I bought it, it was twenty six thousand. Uh, I think you can get one for around I don't know twelve fifteen thousand now. I think uh, you know it just depends on how many cameras there are in the scanning device. So, yeah, I mean you and they have them on the iPad, right? They have the structure scanner on the iPad. Right. Yeah, and you know again, don't. I think it was overkill in the beginning, you know, because the, these scanners are not made for the OMB industry. They're made for they're made for other industries that, like automotive, they want to scan a you know a transmission case and make a cover for the transmission case or something like that, and you know, so you're down to like the you know thousands of an inch or something. We don't we don't need that accuracy for. I mean, you put on a sock, you change the dimension of your leg. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So. Uh, keep in mind, you you want to buy something that's accurate to 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 what you're actually trying to make. You don't need something that's micro accurate to because you're not going to use that accuracy. Yeah, I have heard that the software on the TechMed uh, scanner is actually really good. Yeah, I've heard that across the board. It's very very user friendly. Yes. Yeah. Um, what uh, uh, Joseph Allard asked, uh, what is the base L code? Oh, so, well, you know, on Barry's order form, you know, basically as a clinician, it's up to you to choose the appropriate base code for the design that you're using. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can use 1960, you can use 1940. Uh, if you do an anterior shell, you can use floor reaction, 1945. So just basically, you know, as a clinician, you use your clinical judgment to choose the appropriate L code based on the design that you're using. Exactly. We have we have recommended L codes on our price list. If you want that, we can email that to you. Yeah. So. Do we have any other uh, any other questions from the? Uh, cool. He said sounds good. Um. Thank God, no L codes here in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, can we see from the iPhone with your app? As long as you send an STL file, it doesn't really make the it doesn't matter what the input device is. So we we deal with STL files. We can use OBJ files, but STL files are more consistent and uh, and I think as accurate as OBJ files. But those two file formats we can use to mill out the shape, and that's what we're trying to do. Can I get that app again from Barry? It's on the it's on the uh, it's on the uh, app store. You can download it from Apple's app store, and if you want to use the iPad with the structure scanner, and uh, then we can send you a PDF of how to set it up so that it, you know our logo is there and our order form is there and all of that sort of thing is there. Yeah, that's the TechMed scanner, right? Yeah, it's the TechMed app, but it uh -huh. uses it uses the iPad and the structure scanner. Yeah. So. And Comb, Comb also has something like that. Have you used that at all? We, we've gotten scans from Comb, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, it really doesn't matter what the scanning device is. It's the output, which is the STL file, that's important. That's important. Exactly. Um, okay, what else? Do we have anybody else? Any other questions? If not, I think we can all go to lunch. Oh, no, wait, I think I might have one. Hold on. Oh, very informative. Well, thank you, Joe. He's messaging me in the background. Um, it's been a great presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Barry um, and Ross. I, I think it's been incredibly informative. Um, hey, thanks, Greg. Uh, glad you enjoyed the program. Um, really, thank everybody for being here. It's good to see some of my, uh, my friends. Roger, it's good to see you here. Um, and, um, 
you know, even though none of you picked up the mic and came up to the stage, <laughs> I won't hold it against you. But, you know, coming down the road, you got to start grabbing the mic and getting up here. We can't be the only one that, uh, you know, that you're looking at. We want to see you guys, too. If you're in your PJs, good for you. You know, you can, that's one of the cool things about, about being online is you can be in your, uh, in your PJs, right? So you can see I have a shirt on, but you don't know what, you know. What you're really know. <laughs> um, it's been great, man. Really has. Uh, really appreciate you both. Uh, appreciate the content. I think it's very, very useful. Appreciate everybody who was here. Have a great uh, afternoon and rest of your uh, rest of your Sundays. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, guys. All right. Later.